Okay. Um, so first up, the instructions for submitting assignment one have all been put on online. Um, all we oh, so there's there's basically three separate components. Um, there's your um, there's your storyboard, which you'll be giving a final paper version into your tutor in your lab this week, um, which you should have got some feedback on last week or today if you had lab, today's lab. Um, then you, there's the uh, the script files that you use, so the JavaScript that you, files that you've written, which there are instructions here for how to submit them online. Um, you can just it, basically if you go to this link, um, student give. You'll need to log in with your your details, and hopefully, if I've given it the right details, actually that looks wrong. Never mind. Let's see what happens. It doesn't like me. Maybe that's good. It's actually that doesn't look like the right password anyway. Um, that looks more like my password. There we go. You type your, your course in here. I think it should be able to do comp 1400. And all being well, could we select assignment one? And then we can click the upload button. And hopefully, hopefully it works. Okay, so it doesn't work for me. <laughs> this is always good. Um, I don't know. Anyway, you should try this sometime before. Okay, this is a good <coughs> case in point. Try this before you know the last minute of the thing when it all doesn't work. Actually, see if you can get this to work. It's, uh, it should work. I don't know why it's not working for me. It might not work for me, particularly because I'm not necessarily a member of the class in the same way that you're a member of the class. And so I might not be allowed to upload. Oh, yeah, I can. Maybe? Yeah, okay. So that's better. There's a declaration there that you say that you've, it's all your own work and you can pick a bunch of files that you want to submit that are going to be your scripts. So just the JavaScript files is all I'm looking for. The ones that are marked .js um, in, your, in your Unity project. Um, so we just, I mean, most, so like I said, part of your mark is going to be based on your, um, yeah, present, whatever. Part of your mark is going to be based on your design and, part of, and half of your mark is going to be based on your code and, and your code is both, what, both on whether it's functional and whether or not you've uh, adhered to the sort of design rules, that I, the style rules that I've been telling you so far. So if you've got a good naming of your variables, if you've made your code clearly laid out and that sort of thing. So you can, I think the proportion, of, proportion that's, I think it's 50% for correctness of your code and 50% for, for design and style. Um, I think that's the, the details that I laid out, but you can check that in what I wrote previously. Um, we won't actually be looking uh, in detail at your world, and we won't be looking in particular at what models you've used or anything like that. Um, I don't really care. Um, you, it's there for you to amuse yourself by picking, making something that looks cool, but, um, but that's entirely up to you. There are also instructions here on how to, uh, if we go back, no, that's not going to take us back far enough. Well, if we go back to here, oh no, we go back over here, that's right. Um, so there are also instructions here for how to do it from the command line, but unless you're going to bother learning how to use Unix, I wouldn't bother doing that. Um, I don't know why Razor put those in. Um, you'll, so you'll also, in, next, um, in your next toot, um, you'll also be uploading a version of your um, Sorry, in your subsequent lab after the deadline, so, so next week's lab, um, you'll be uploading a version of your assignment to your class web, uh, to your, yeah, to your web page. So every CSE student gets a web page. You should have had a, a play around with that in, um, in, la in this week's lab or last week's lab. Um, so you can uh, put anything you want in there, but in this case, we're going to put um, put your assignment in there so that we can actually go to your, go to the web your web page and play your game. Um, so uh, we'll do that in in labs because it's probably a little bit tricky for you to do it from home. Um, so, but there's instructions there if you need to know how to do it. Um, 
but um, you know, if you can't if you can't work out how to make that work, then uh, talk to your tutor about it and make sure it works. But it's just so that we can actually then you know play your game and see that it does what you say it does, um, and so you can play each other's games and show off the exciting things that you've built. So that's assignment one submission. Um, that's basically it. Yeah. Cool. So today, so the last thing we started doing in the in the last lecture was adding asteroids to our world. And I think I added us. We created a single asteroid which was moving around. Now we're going to show how to make lots of asteroids and how to get them all doing different things. Um, and in fact, I'm going to jump out of that and go straight into dive back into Unity. So last week we wrote. Uh, I think we were in, which scene were we in? We were in this scene. So one of the things you'll find in Unity that's handy is you can make different scenes. So I've actually got the, uh, the scene that we were working on. Um, there it is with our asteroid. And if I remember rightly, we had it going a random, yes, a random direction every time we reloaded. That's a very large asteroid. You might want to make it a little bit smaller. Um, so. But you can also, you can create new, if you create a new scene, it'll start with another empty world, but with the same objects, with the same resources available to you. And so here's my final finished, whoops, well, almost finished, slightly broken. Okay, it's got an error in it. We'll go back and have a look at that later. Um, but what we're interested in doing now is let's first of all make this, this asteroid a little bit more reasonable. So let's uh, scale that down a little bit. Um, actually, let's scale it like this. Let's say it's about 5 by 5 by 3. How does that look? Oh, it's still a bit circular. That, that one doesn't really matter. Let's call it 5 by 3. That's a funny looking asteroid. There we go. Um, okay, and we can also move around in the world. It's a bit fast. But good, so we have that all working. Now, if we look back at the, uh, the asteroid move script that we were writing before. Um, so if you remember, we started, I made a slight change to this, I renamed this velocity, but we started off with a, um, picking a random angle in which it was going to go and, rot and then taking the velocity vector and rotating it by that angle, um, which gave us, meant that every time we started, started we have an asteroid moving in a random direction. Now, um, the problem here is that at the moment we don't have any way of, of controlling the actual speed of the asteroid. So we should probably um, have, like we have a variable for the player's speed, we should probably put a variable in here for the, uh, for the asteroid's speed, which we can make a float and say it's initially, um, it's initially 1. And we can now scale our velocity vector. Um, we'll actually just do it in here. We'll scale that velocity vector by our speed. So now we should be able to adjust the speed of our, of our asteroid. So if we go looking at our asteroid, we now have a speed thing here. We can change it down to 0 0.5, if that's that. And so now we have a slower moving asteroid. And we can, if we want, we can change this on the fly to a very fast asteroid. Oh, or not. Oh, OK, so changing that on the fly doesn't work, change anything. Of course not. And the reason why it doesn't change anything is because we only use speed, the only time we refer to speed is here in the start function, and the start function only runs once, which is when we first uh, run, we first create the asteroid. And so it creates the velocity vector um, of that length, but then once it's done that, the velocity, if I change the speed, the velocity vector doesn't change because there's nothing, there's nothing in the update code which changes the velocity vector. So if I wanted to change the speed, I'd have to if I wanted to be able to change the speed dynamically, I'd have to change, recalculate the velocity by the speed in here in the update function rather than just once at the start. Um, the other thing we should do um, is it's really, it's, um, it's bad in this kind of thing to be moving by having a fixed velocity, well, so be moving by a fixed velocity per frame rather than per time unit. Um, particularly, like I said, different frames might be different lengths, but the big deal here um, is that if I run this on, on different computers, um, a faster computer, the whole game will suddenly run faster, which is not what we want, right? 
We want the, the asteroids to be moving at the same speed regardless of whether they run on my computer or your computer or some enormous supercomputer in the university has somewhere. It should, the game should always go the same speed. So the way we do that is by multiplying our velocity, again, and we've talked about this before, but multiply our velocity by time dot delta time, which is the amount of time that has happened since the last frame. And so, um, and we do that, and we should probably go and do that in our other methods. I'm not going to go and change that now, but I think our player, our ship move function, a ship move script, um, will also need to do that. Of course, once we've done that, we ne we'll now need to go back over here and adjust that speed because one, one unit per, s per second is not the same as one unit per frame. One unit per second is an awful lot slower. So we now have to change the speed to something much more reasonable, which is about, we'll probably find a speed of about 20 or 30. We'll do what we want. There we go. So it's closer to what we had before. Um, so now we've got a single asteroid moving around in the game. Um, but what we want to do is obviously have multiple asteroids. Um, now what we could do is just go through that entire process again, create another asteroid, put it somewhere in the world, um, give, put the scripts on it, initialize its val values and do that. But in general, we, we want to, in the future, as we sort of expand in this game, we don't, don't just want to have one asteroid or two asteroids, we want to be able to create a world with as many asteroids as we want. And maybe the first level has one asteroid and the second level of the game has two and the, so forth. And we don't want to have to do all that by hand and it's a waste of, you know, it's, it's wasted work to have to reproduce things. So programmers hate having to repeat themselves. Um, so anything we can do to, uh, to factor out something so that we don't have to repeat ourselves is really valuable. So one of the things we can do in Unity is building what's called a prefab. A prefab is like a... Um, uh, a structure for a reusable structure for making objects. So um, we can come into asteroids here and we can say create uh, prefab. And there's our new prefab. And if we grab our asteroid that we've just built and drag it onto that prefab, then that prefab is now, um, now contains that ast the, all the details of that asteroid. Now if I grab that prefab and dra drag it into the world, Actually, let's try to get somewhere where I can actually see. Um, let's get the top-down view. Uh, do not that view. We actually want the Z view. Z view. Zoom in a bit. Okay. Whoops, that's the wrong key. I'm zooming in with the wrong zoom tool. Um, this one, zoom in. Which button zoom? That zoom. No, that's not going to zoom. That one zoom. Okay. Right, there we are. So um, we're now we grab that prefab that we just created and drop it into the world. There's another asteroid. And we can drop it in again, and there's another asteroid. Uh, you can't see that asteroid because it just dropped it on top of the other asteroid. But um, but every single um, so there's one of them. There's the other one. Um, so we can create and we can do the same if we drop um, the prefab over here directly into our hierarchy. It does the same thing. So it creates yet another asteroid that looks the same as all the others. And now, hopefully if we play the game, there we go, there's a bunch of asteroids. Um, they're not all at the same Z coordinate, so they're different sizes, but they are actually, uh, they are actually identical asteroids. Now they're all, when we start, they all choose their direction randomly because they all run that start script separately. So they'll all actually head in different directions. So this is a nice starting point, um, but it's still, uh, Still, we're still having to create them by hand, right? We're still having to put the asteroids in the, in the world by hand. It's nice that we have this one way of making copies really easily, but, um, but doing it by hand is a little bit annoying. Let's go back to having only one asteroid. The other nice thing about, the, um, about having the prefab is that if we create, actually, we can even delete that original asteroid. If we create a bunch of asteroids using the prefab, um, one there, Another one there. There you go. Then, um, so say we uh, we think those asteroids are moving a bit slowly. Okay. So we can come to the prefab and look at the inspector and edit speed in the prefab to 50. And if we go back and look at each of the asteroids we've built, the speed here has been updated to 50, and the speed here has been updated to 50 as well. So. 
any changes we make to the prefab is automatically reflected in all the, in all the instances of that prefab, uh, which is really handy so, so that now if we want to tweak things, rather than having to tweak every individual asteroid one by one, we can just tweak the pre prefab and all the other things will follow. Now the, uh, the tricky, uh, tricky thing here though is if we do accidentally, if I take this asteroid and change its speed to 40 and then I go back to the prefab and decide I want to change all the asteroid speeds to back to 20. Now if we look at the one that we didn't change, it's gone back to 20. But if we look at the one we did change, its value is still 40. So if we change the values on an individual instance, it overrides the values from the parent. So as long as we haven't changed the values, the, uh, it'll, anything will, or any changes on the parent will automatically be reflected on the child. But if we go and change a, a value directly on the child, Unity thinks that means we want to override the parent value and just change the value on the child. Um, so sometimes this can mess us up because if you, you're meaning to change the um, you mean to change the prefab, but you accidentally change just one of the asteroids and then wonder why the changes aren't being reflected. And then you go back and fix the thing in the prefab, but then you realize that you now haven't fixed the one in the one that you, the one that you changed before, and it gets a little bit messy. So if you're wanting to, you've got to be careful. If you're wanting to change every single one of them, you've got to change the value in the prefab rather than in, the, in, the, in any of the individuals, or it'll mess you around. Um, Okay, so now we have a way of having multiple asteroids in the world. So let me just uh, go over. So what I just said um, is in the notes. Uh, we want, if we want to create multiple instances of something, the prefab let, lets us do this. Um, there's the instructions for creating a prefab. You create a single instance of the object you want and you set all the properties for it. Um, then when you've got that, uh, that single instance, you know it's right. Then you create a prefab, which is initially an empty prefab, um, and you drag the object you want to duplicate into that prefab, and it saves a copy of that the object in there. And you can now delete the original, and the pre it'll be stored in the prefab. And then when you want to create instances of the prefab, you just you can just drag them into either the scene or the hierarchy, and it creates new objects. Um, so it's a really useful way of creating uh, instance same instances of objects. If you download a model um, off the web quite often you might, get a, you might get a prefab that you can then put into your world in various ways. Um, it depends on where you, I mean if you're downloading just a, um, is it an FBA file, you probably won't get, you'll just get, a, you'll just get the model. But if you download a Unity prefab, you might be able to add a world, add an object to your world that not only has a model but has a bunch of behaviors attached to it and other things, um, which can be useful. So they're on some of the Unity websites, you can actually, um, get entire objects that do like have quite complicated behavior built into them so you can drag one of those into your game and it will have all its behaviors attached to it. Okay. Um, like I said, if you modify, if you change the prefab, you change all the instances. If you only change one instance, then you override the value in the prefab. Now, so what we're going to do now is create um, a whole bunch of asteroids. And what I'm going to do is rather than just um, what I'm going to do is get rid of those two from the world first of all. I'm going to create an object in the world that is going to be um, the parent of all our, the parent location of all our um, asteroids. So in game object menu we have an option here to create empty. If we create an empty object, it's like we, I mean it's like any other object we created in the world except that all it has on it is a transform. So every other object has some has a some sort of mesh and other things attached to it. An empty object is just is just a transform. So it's just a point in space that has no other representation. So if we put that in our in our world um, at the middle, zero, 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 and we play, we will not see anything because there the object is there but there's nothing to see because it has no model attached to it or anything like that. No mesh. Um, the useful thing about this is this can the, we can use this in the hierarchy as a grouping object. So we're going to call it asteroids, if I can spell asteroids. And um, this is going to be the parent location for all our asteroids. So I've talked about the hierarchy before, how if we have an, an object, one object attached to another one, the, uh, the child object moves with the parent. Um, and one of the one of the uses of that that I showed you is that we can attach the, um, in, in fact, in right here we can attach the parent to the ship, the camera to the ship, 
now if we, uh, well, it won't look like anything because, um, yeah, look, see, nothing happens. But what's really happening is the ship is moving around and the camera's moving with it. Yes? Can you turn the screen across a little bit? Sorry, oh, yeah, it's not. Sorry. That's weird. Okay, no worries. Um, I'll just, I'll just have to make it a little bit smaller so I don't lose the other side. Is that better? It's still not very visible. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I mean, what the reason why you don't see anything happening there is because the ship is moving, but the camera is moving with the ship, and so the camera is following the ship around, and so nothing's happening. Um, but the uh, if we added some, if in fact if I added an asteroid to the world, you'd see you'd see more of what's happening. If we have the ship, there we go. So now if we turn the ship around. So the camera is attached to the ship rather than to the world. So it's moving with the world. Now it gets rather confused about what happens when we, when we go off the screen and stuff. Um, but that's doing that. But that's not what we want to do right now. What we want to do is use, we're going to use these asteroids, um, this empty asteroids object is what we call it. Um, well, it goes under various names, but we can call it a joint. It's like a, it's a, a thing that just we just put it in the world in order to join together a bunch of other objects. It doesn't have any any uh, part to it itself. It's just there to join uh, a bunch of sub objects together. And in this case, we're going to kind of use it as a uh, as a holding th object for all our asteroids. Um, so to create asteroids in the first place in the world, we don't have any. We've got to work, we've got to write a script which creates asteroids, right? So rather than creating the asteroids by hand, we're going to actually make gen every time we create a new level, it's going to automatically generate a certain number of asteroids. And then if we're going to do that, we have to have somewhere to put that script. Um, the natural place to put that script is if we create a, um, a joint like this, and all the asteroids can live within that joint, be attached to that joint, and the script can go on there. So. Um, there's the, I won't look in the full version of that, but we'll, um, we'll create a new version of that script. Create JavaScript. And I'm going to, I'm actually going to delete that prefab and use my other, pre, other asteroid prefab. You, um, so we call this create asteroids zero, um, because it's the minor version. Um, so what we want to do, this is not going to do anything on update, so we can delete that. Actually, what we'll just change that. All, the, all that we want this script to do is that when we start the world, we want to create a certain number of asteroids. Um, how many asteroids? Well, let's put that in a variable so we can make it however many asteroids we want. So number of asteroids. Uh, and we can say that's an int, and we'll say initially that maybe there's four. Okay, just as an example. So, um, I'll just sh first of all show you how to create a single asteroid. So it's very easy. Um, we have a uh, there's a method called instantiate. We'll say var asteroid equals instantiate. If I can spell it, instantiate, and we need a prefab. Now, <coughs> excuse me. That prefab is also going to be specified in a variable. So we say we have a prefab. It's going to be a game object because prefabs are always game objects. And we won't set an initial value for that. Um, so now, actually, we just save that and come back over here. We copy that script onto our asteroids. And now if we look at the asteroids, OK, here we go. We have um, those fields. One of them is the prefab field. If we grab our prefab asteroid and drop it in that field, then now if we run, hopefully, yeah, there it goes. It creates an asteroid. So there, aren't, there weren't any asteroids in our scene initially, but, um, but we've managed to create one um, using code rather than using the, using the editor. Um, so the general, it's a very simple, generally, all you do is say instantiate, and then the argument to instantiate is the prefab that you want to instantiate from. Um, now, this creates one asteroid. We actually want to create num this, however many num asteroids are in here. So we go back and we use what we talked about last week. So I talked uh, at length, but we never got really an example of it, about the for loop. 
So we're going to use a for loop to do this instantiation operation a number of times rather than just once. So the for loop takes an initializer, um, we're going to say from zero, we're going to finish when we're, we're at four, and we're going to add one on every try. And that's your, that is what your, uh, you know, 99% of your for loops are going to look exactly like that, saying count from zero up one, two, three, and then when you get to four, stop. Now in this case, four isn't the number we want. Four is a magic number, right? That's not what we want. What we actually want here is to replace four with number of asteroids. Um, now it'll count up to whatever the value in number of asteroids is, and it'll stop. Um, now, this is a, one of those weird computer science things. Normally, if we want to do something four times, we'll, we'll count zero, one, two, three, and stop when we get to four, right? And so four, will, it'll happen four times because the, the fourth loop doesn't ever get executed. Um, that's just one of those weird computer scientist habits um, that's a over from the bad old days. Um, you could very equally do for, for I start at one, count up to and including four, and then stop when you're greater than four. Um, so, uh, but you'll see almost, you'll see that code almost never, right? Um, just because computer scientists just get very used to counting from zero rather than from one. Um, it's a weird thing, but you just get the hang of it. And so, if you ever see code that looks like that, you know what that means is um, do this operation for a uh, number of ast as many times as the number of asteroids variable tells us. Um, and that's a pretty standard kind of piece of code. And now, like I said before, we could do like um, a lot other variations on this. We can also, if we wanted to, um, refer to the number of the asteroid in here, but that's not really important. Um, so, but let's go and see what that does to our, our code. Oops, oh, and so we've got errors. Okay, good. What did I do wrong? Did you do, oh, okay, sorry, that's not meant to be int. That's meant to be var. I'm, missing up, I'm mixing up my languages. Um, I've just been programming in a different language and I forgot to change. This is a problem when you get to a certain stage, you forget which language is which. Okay, so now it's created, ooh, okay. Oh, that's, a, that's something I, let's go in here. Asteroid. Sorry, I've got another script on there. Ast let's disable that script that you don't want there yet. Um, so there we are, we created four asteroids, but mm, okay, there's still something in there that's handling collisions. Why is it handling collisions? Never mind. That's what I get for copying there. Let's go and, uh, never mind. Somewhere in there, I've obviously put some code to handle collisions. Turn that off. Maybe it's in the player. Where's the player? Ship. Ship move three. Uh, I don't know. Somewhere in there, I've, I've put some code that I was going to show you later on handling collisions. But let's so, uh, let's just change that so that let's actually the easiest place to start to fix this is just to move the ship out of the way so that they won't collide with it. There we go. So what we've done, we've created four asteroids, and we could go back, and if we wanted to. We could come back over to our asteroid object here and turn this into 10, and it creates 10 asteroids. Now they all start in the same position um, because there's nothing in there, there's no code in there that tells them to move the object. And since our original, when we were creating our prefab, since we created our prefab there, um, every other object has inherited that position from it. Um, and so they're all doing, all starting from the same spot. And they're all moving in different directions because each one ca randomly calculates its velocity as soon as it's created. So that's, so the movement is fine, but we want to actually make them spread out now, right? So it's no, no point in having all our asteroids start in the same point in space. So, so this is good, but we need to move the asteroid. Um, now what we want to do is pick a random point in space where we're going to put that asteroid down. Um, now, to do that, we need to know how big space is, and we've already got that stored in our code somewhere. Um, we have, oh, in fact, I have that. Okay. Um, so we had before, um, yes, so we had before this wraparound script, um, which we put on our objects, which, which had this rectangle, which told us how big space was. Um, 
Now we actually want to use these numbers again, but we don't want to use them for, um, for wrapping around. We want to use them for picking a random point in that, in that space. Uh, so in order to do that, oops, go back to Unitron. Um, no, whatever, that's right, that there. Um, in order to do that, we, what we'll do is we'll create another object. Now I've actually already created one here. It's another empty object. Um, but it's just there as a way to have a, a script which tells us about space. And, um, and this is a, a script that looks very much like that wraparound script before, um, but we've added another method on here. And this method um, picks a random point in space. So knowing the, um, knowing the, the size of space, we've got space x, space y, and the width and height, Knowing that we've already got that size of space, we just take the x coordinate and then we add a random number up to from zero up to the width. So if I can draw that on the board, um, actually, did I bring a pen? Yes, I did. So we've said that space is a rectangle in our case. The, uh, the bottom corner is some x, y location, and we want to pick a random point in here. Um, so this is our, uh, let's say it's px, comma, py. Right? So that's our point. So what we do is knowing the, uh, the width of the space, we pick a random number between 0 and 1 and multiply it by the width. And so that'll give us, so we pick, um, you know, 2 thirds. Then we multiply by, by the width, and that's two-thirds of the width. And then we pick, this might be a half, we might pick the random number a half, and that's half of the height. And so we start at this point, onto the x, we add two-thirds, we add two-thirds of the width. To the y, we add half of the height, which is not half, but never mind, it looks like half. Um, and then we get the point we wanted, right? So, so what we've done in our code is exactly that. Pick two random numbers. Um, each of these random numbers is between 0 and 1, like we talked about previously. Multiply the, this one by the width and this one by the height, and then add the bottom, bottom corner. Um, and this gives us a, um, a location in 2D space. Now, the z-coordinate is always, is always 0, because this is always in, the, in that 0 plane on space, in, in our case. So this is a nice little function that um, no, uh, that, tell, that can give us a random point in space. Now the reason why we put it here is because this, this information, um, this method uses information about the size of the space, right? And so it's natural to put the, uh, put the method in the same script uh, that contains that information. So one of, the, one of the key design problems in computer programming is working out which methods go on in what objects. Now really, you can, according to the computer's point of view, you can put any code anywhere you like. Um, but what we try to do is keep information local to a certain script. So the way that we've done this is that no other script needs to know about the size of the space. Um, so the details that are in, in this variable space at the top, um, we can keep private to just this script. And when we need to know something about that, we'll use one of these methods to, in order to access that information. Um, so it's generally a good programming practice to, uh, to keep information as local as possible um, and to only, sort of, only communicate as much information between scripts as you need to. Now, that's not really going to matter a heck of a lot to you guys, um, but it's gen you, you, otherwise, the, the, uh, the other consequence is you end up with scripts that refer to other scripts that refer to other scripts all over the place. And it's much neater to have scripts that are sort of more, much more self-contained. And so... Aim to keep your script self-contained as you can. It's really an art after a while of, of knowing how to do this. And for a big and complicated project, it, it often becomes, even the best programmers often end up with a horrible mess that they then have to go and sit down and work out how to separate into, into um, sensible com components. Um, but uh, as a general rule of thumb, try to keep information local to, to a particular script. So given that we have this, me this function on this, on this script now, um, and we've attached, we can then attach that script to another placeholder object. Um, this is going to be the space object. And then we can, um, then our asteroids, when we're creating asteroids, we're going to now ask that space for a, a random point. 
So we're going to have here, we're going to say um, the space is another variable. It's a game object. Actually, no, it's going to be a, um, what was the name of that script that I said? It was a space frame. And now all I need to do in here is got, having got that space, I can ask for a random point in space and I can put the asteroid at that point. Asteroid.transform.position equals random point. So now I can take, now we've got another variable up here which is asking for a space frame. Now this is an interesting thing. Um, so I've shown you before how you can take a game object and put it in here or a prefab and put it in here. You can also put a link to another script in here. Um, and the way you do that is by taking a, um, you find an object that has that script on it and you drop that object in there. Um, so wherever it was, oh damn, you can't do that. I've got to go back to there, then grab that and drop that into there. Right. So what this does is it looks on the object you dropped in there for a script of the, of the type you want. And if it finds one, it then it then uh, uses that to, uh, to, initialize the to initialize the variable. So if I try grabbing something that doesn't have a space frame on it, it should complain. Let's just see what, no, it doesn't even let me drop it there, right? It doesn't let me drop a, a, the ship there because the ship doesn't have a space frame attached to it. Um, gets a little bit more complicated if you have more than one group of the same name attached to something, but you probably just don't do that because that's a bad idea. Um, so what we can do now is, um, when we're given a reference to that script, we can call functions in that script. So if, if we've got a, a space frame script that we've just found is attached to the space object, then we can, um, then if we, we assign that space frame script to this variable space, and then we can call functions that we've written within that script. So if we've got functions in one script, we can call uh, if we mark functions in another script. Um, which is a really uh, sort of handy way. If you've got different objects that have certain functions attached to them, we can call them from other scripts by linking them together. Okay, so that shows us how to, so that should do what we want. That should now, I'm hoping, yes, create all our asteroids at random points in space. Um, which is what we want, and they're colliding with the ship because I've got some code in there somewhere to, uh, to make them destroy. Um, the prefab that I'm using has a couple of extra scripts attached to it that, um, that allow collisions, but we'll talk more about how to do that later. Um, so going back to the notes and going over what we just talked about, um, so we said that we can use the hierarchy to connect things together. Um, it's also useful to just put uh, empty objects in the hierarchy. Um, that act as placeholders for something or um, so in the case of the, the asteroids it'll be a container for all the asteroids. In the case of the, um, the space object it's just a, it's an object that has no representation. It's just, it's just holding data and scripts for us. It doesn't actually have any reality in the world. Uh, now every script has to be attached to an object so we had to have something there to attach it to. It didn't really make sense to attach it to the, sh the ship or to, the a to an asteroid or any individual thing. So we just had a thing there in the world which is the space um, which we can refer to. Now if we wanted to, to, to attach a model of that we could but we don't really need to. It's just there as a placeholder. Um, so uh, more complicated scripts you'll end up having um, some things that you want some ideas that you want to represent in your, in your code that don't really relate to a particular object in your world. And then you can just stick those things on an empty thing, on an empty object in your world. Um, it's usually good to name those empty things appropriately as what they represent though. Um, so we can create joints uh, in this way. Um, and we talked about the, uh, the instantiate uh, method. Instantiate method takes a game object which is a, a prefab and creates a new instance of that prefab and that instance immediately appears in the world. Now, excuse me, um, so we, the other thing we probably want to do here that I didn't talk about in the notes but when we, um, when we do create asteroids, I said before that we were going to use the, the asteroids, this empty object as a container for them but if you notice at the moment they don't get created in there, they get created in the, in the 
in the top of the hierarchy. Um, we can actually manipulate the hierarchy in code as well by doing this um, game object, which refers to the, in this case, to the asteroids, the group, the joint, uh, dot, no, sorry, not game object, the transform is what I want, transform dot, uh, no, I'm getting it wrong again, excuse me, sorry, Astero that's what I want, asteroid dot transform dot parent equals transform. Um, that says the parent, the, uh, so the transform contains, the hierarchy is contained in the transform. Um, and so that says that the asteroid is a child of this object, which is, um, so the, the parent of the asteroid is this, this, this transform, so which is going to be the, 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 the joint. Um, so every asteroid has that joint as its parent. Now with that code, um, it should now create all those asteroids yeah, so all those asteroids are now children of the asteroids joint, um, which doesn't achieve us anything at the moment, um, other than just a bit of neatness in our hierarchy, in that we've now all got them in, in, a, in the same location in the hierarchy rather than throughout the hierarchy. Um, so, you know, neatness always counts for something. Um, later on, we'll actually use that in order to keep a track of how many asteroids there are still in the world. When we start destroying asteroids, um, we can, the asteroids joint can compute how many asteroids are left inside it. Now, if those asteroids were just uh, distributed throughout the hierarchy, we'd never know how many there were. But if you have, you, any parent can always count its children. Um, and so the asteroid's parent can count the number of children inside, and when they're all gone, it can say game over or, or start a new level or whatever's appropriate. But we'll do that later. Um, so in a, using a similar kind of code, um, what we can do, say we want to start firing bullets. Um, so what I've done is create a bullet uh, prefab. There's an instance of it. I'll stick one there. Have a squeeze at that. It's a little blue, a little red dot. Um, it's very exciting. Each bullet has, if you look at the prefab, each bullet has um, a wraparound script on it, so it'll wrap around the world. It has a bullet move script. Um, which we'll look at in a second, and uh, won't worry about the rigid body. So the bullet move script, um, pretty much what we'd expect uh, for starters, it has a velocity, um, and every time we update it, it moves by that velocity multiplied by time dot delta time. Um, and but it also has this business. So, okay, so we'll ignore that for just the moment. What's interesting then is when we uh, when we look at the ship script, ship ship move. Oh no, not that one. It's there's another script here. Fire bullet. Okay. So the fire bullet script. Um, now, if we ignore a lot of this, actually, we'll just nuke a lot of that. All that we're interested in is um, every time, well actually, whoops, not every time. Let me uh, go back and say, let's get rid of that. So I'll just comment it out for the time being so that it'll stay there but not. Uh, and we'll remove, we'll remove that. So apart from uh, those lines, which we'll just hide for the time being, so what you've got there, it should be fairly familiar. Um, on every update, we check whether the space key is down. If the space key is down, we instantiate a new bullet. Now we've got a, a longer version of instantiate here. We've got the bullet prefab, um, but we've also got this posi gun position and gun rotation. Um, now the question is when we create a bullet, what we want to do is create the bullet at the front of the ship. We don't just want to create it anywhere in the world. Um, so what we've done, what I've done is, here's the ship, what I've done is attach a placeholder to the front of the ship, right there, um, which is where the bullets are going to come from. Now because the, the, that placeholder, that empty placeholder is attached to the ship, whenever the ship moves around, that gun position will move with it. So I don't need to worry about saying, 
rather than say fire the bullet from so many units in front of the ship and calculate that position every time I want to fire a bullet, I just put an empty placeholder there. And then that placeholder floats around in front of the ship. Wherever the ship moves, the placeholder moves. And when I create a bullet, I say create a bullet at that placeholder. Um, so what I've done in the code is um, the gun value refers to that placeholder. Actually, I don't need that code. That can go. Um, so we can, then we can just take, if we take that script and put it on the ship, there it is. Now we need to specify a, um, a bullet prefab, which is the one that we made, that I showed you before, not that one, that one. Go back to the ship. It's a really annoying feature that it always jumps around. If we specify a bullet prefab, we also need to specify a gun. In this case, we can just grab this gun and drop it there. And then we talk about, uh, I've, there's got a reloading feature there, but we'll forget about that for the moment. So hopefully now if I play that, if I press space, oh, OK, um, that's a, what did I do there? Oh, I know what that is. Go back to my bullet. Huh, what am I doing there? Oh, OK, yes. Sorry, this is some code that I was going to show you later again. I should have removed this. Let's try that again. Huh. Why is it still doing that? That's odd. Anyway, I don't know what that's doing. <laughs> yeah, embarrassing. You're embarrassing me. Stop it. Why is that deleting lifetime? Oh, okay. Let's try. Okay, let's do that and take that and take that line out as well because that's also not happening yet. Try that. There we go. Okay, that's what I wanted to show. So every time I press the space bar, it creates another bullet and they all move. And if I move, turn the ship around, it creates the bullet there. And if I move the ship over here, oops, it creates the bullet. Ooh, they're very slow moving bullets so that they kind of move around behind me. But so it's doing what, it's doing what I said it would do after I uh, fixed some things that I didn't say I was going to do. Um, so putting back some of that code. So the first thing, the first thing there, actually, let's make that bullet move faster because that, that velocity really sucks. So. Um, uh, always do that. Um, so we go here that velocity was 0 0.7. Let's make that something considerably faster. That's more like it. No, it's still too slow. Let's make it faster than that. Okay, that feels better. Right, now as fast as I can make bullets, they all go around and if I turn around I can spray them in every direction. We can have bullet hell. Now there's a bit of a problem here in that the bullets actually don't go away and we just keep creating them forever, right? So we, what we want to do is actually destroy some of those bullets after a while. Otherwise, I don't know if you can see that, I can't see much from this angle, but we have bullets flying in every which direction and they're going to live on forever um, because we've got nothing to actually destroy them with. So the, uh, the simplest way of destroying an object um, is there's a, there's a destroy method. Um, and the nice thing about the destroy method is the second argument is the first argument is what the thing is that we're meant to destroy, but the second is argument is how far into the future do we have to wait before we destroy it. So if we want to have bullets disappear one second after we've fired them, we can say if we have here lifetime is equal to one, we've already said at the top of the screen. Um, so now if we run that with those changes, let me just make sure I shave those changes, if we run that and, and fire a bunch of bullets. They don't keep they don't hang around. You still can't see it, but they're not hanging around. After a second, those bullets will disappear. So the bullets get to a certain distance, and then they just disappear, um, which is much more like what we want. Now, what we can also, um, well, the code in here that I won't, um, that you weren't meant to see, but I'll show you anyway. Um, oops, this code down the bottom. What this is meant to do, and we'll talk about this on Wednesday, is this is actually um, a different event 
I said before that there are lots of different events that, are, that uh, Unity handles. This is an event for when things collide with one another. And, um, and in particular, this, is, this piece of code um, is look, checking whether a bullet has collided with an asteroid. And if the bullet has collided with an asteroid, it destroys the bullet immediately. So no, you don't have to worry about what this says. But what uh, you notice here is this is another version of destroy that has only one argument, which just means destroy it straight away. Um, so it's effectively the same as saying uh, a timeline, a, a lifetime of zero. Um, the object will just be destroyed immediately. So going back to our notes, just to wrap up. So we talked about how to create objects on the fly. We've now we've also seen that we can also destroy objects in the fly in code. Um, if we have a reference to that, ob that game object, we can just say destroy it now, which is just destroy game object, or we can say destroy it in, a, in the future um, after a certain number of seconds. And this is really useful because often when we create an object, we only want that object to hang around for a certain fixed amount of time. So we can say when we start in the start event handler for that object, we can say destroy this object in 10 seconds time and the object will automatically destroy itself in 10 seconds time. So you could make a message that will automatically self-destruct uh, you know, 10 seconds before, after you started reading it or something. So um, that's all I had to talk about today. Um, but generally this is, I mean, so now we can start making quite more complicated programs because rather than just having the objects that we put in the scene at the beginning, we can have objects that we add to the scene as we go and we can have objects removed from the scene as we go as well. Um, and we can do that because we have the ability to create these prefabs which allow us to create duplicates, many duplicates of the same object. All right, thank you all for coming. I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>